I'm Cece Washburn from County Fire, um, and I'm here with Lucy Nichols, who is a student activist in Manchester and one of the key organisers of um, ENDS Spiking Now. Um, we're going to be talking about this massive recent demonstration in Manchester. So hi, Lucy. And um, what prompted you and other activists to call the protest? Um, and can you give us an idea to the extent of the problem? Um, so, yeah, we... Basically, I've been spiking has been a problem for a little while in Manchester and around other cities. And um, I guess for people who don't know what it is, who, who might be watching this, is um, spiking is when people, usually men, um, will put date rape drugs in the drinks of usually women. Although this does affect everyone, it's not just women who get spiked because a lot of the time someone will see an empty glass and put a date rape drug in it and not know who the target is just hope it's a woman and it happens a lot in, in gay clubs as well so spiking is is this sort of really big issue for for especially young women especially students in in pubs and clubs and music venues and stuff like that um and it, over the last few weeks i would say arguably since since this new fresh semester of, of university has started but also since the clubs have reopened since covid um spiking has been really really bad um and you just get just been hearing loads and loads of horror stories about girls who have had um have, have been spiked or had date rape drugs sort of unknowingly given to them um and who've completely blacked out um and don't remember what happened the night before and i'm sure there have been plenty of cases of, of of sexual violence um as a result of date rape drugs and all that kind of stuff um and more recently which is you know the probably the most scary part is that um, we're hearing stories of, of people being injected, injected with date rape drugs. So the age old thing of I'll just cover your drink doesn't really work if, if people are being injected with date rape drugs um, and then don't remember at all what's happened. Um, so what sort of prompted this protest was um, this thing called Girls Night In was called, um, which was largely organised, especially in Manchester, organised by the student unions. Um, and sort of other groups of students as well but it's, it's called Girls Night In and it was a sort of like sort of monolithic Instagram page and, and you, know, you know this campaign had the same name everywhere and the same sort of logos and stuff like that um, and what Girls Night In called for was please the name um, was a sort of nationwide boycott of clubs and, and venues and just going sort of going out generally um, in within the space of this this last the past week and every city more or less would have a different day of the boycott um and it was obviously like really well really well publicized everyone knew about it loads and loads of people were saying no i'm not going to go clubbing next week um and then i think this was organized on the sort of on the monday or the tuesday of last the week before last and on the wednesday so um the wednesday before the protest someone uh someone texted me one of the other organizers and said hey this would be a good idea a good day for a protest or something like that um and I obviously immediately jumped on it because even before the girls night in stuff even before the boycott was announced me and a few other activists have been flowing around this idea of starting an anti-spiking campaign just because of how scary it is being spiked and how little everyone seems to be doing about it so when this like boycott was announced um this you know a fellow organizer of mine um messaged me saying hey this would be a good idea for, to do that protest of yours. And obviously I immediately jumped on it because, I mean, our thinking at the End Spiking Now campaign is that while the boycott is good, it's really good, and it's done so much to get the message out there now, everyone's talking about it, it's not enough to boycott a club for one night, um, especially considering when the boycott was called, a lot of clubs um, announced that they wouldn't be open. So, for instance, in Manchester, the boycott was on the 27th, and after it was called and everyone seemed to be agreeing that it was a really good idea, loads of the clubs said they weren't going to open that night anyway, which they painted as an act of solidarity with, with women who were protesting against being spiking, but really was just a sort of an exercise in minimising profit loss. Um, so while the boycott is really good, it's not enough. Um, my philosophy is always that the best way to make any sort of change is to mobilise and get people out on the streets. Um, and that was my thinking with this. And it has been for a little while, which is I think the boycott is what pushed us to, to call a protest um, in the first place. So my thinking was we need to launch a campaign, launch an, like an emergency protest. We have like a week to do this and get as many people on the streets as humanly possible while we have this momentum while everyone was talking about spiking um, or 
for young people um and it ended up going pretty well and I think now everyone is sort of at least peripherally aware of the issue um which is a massive issue you know every single woman will have a have a story um of, of spiking or having to carry their friends home who've been spiked or seeing someone who's been spiked so yeah that it was sort of prompted by the, the long term the long term prompts were this issue that's been going on and has been affecting women for a really long time and in the short term it was really just a response to the boycott and thinking boycott is good but it's not enough especially if we're only going to boycott for one night um in the middle of the week when no one goes out anyway um so let's get some people on the streets that's all brilliant Lucy um and you know there were huge numbers there um I think 2000 correct me if I'm wrong um and it was an amazing response so what was the mood on the demo and um, were you expecting that that kind of reaction and those kind of numbers and um and you I mean you talked a bit about about how you organized already but like how did you build the demo and how did you get it all going um so I will start with answering how we built it um essentially we we did that that thing that is now really popular is just releasing a graphic um and then organizing later so we we decided we were going to do it we released a graphic and then organizing came afterwards if that makes sense I sort of was speaking to my friend speaking to another one of the organizers about maybe we should do this and then I floated the idea around with a few people who I thought might be able to speak for instance Jade Doswell um who's a Fallowfield the, the councillor for Fallowfield which is the area in Manchester that most students live um she said it was like you know a good idea I spoke to the local people's assembly who said it was a good idea and thought right let's let's do it um so I did it uh we did it we got the graphic out there we had loads of students sharing it and then it was just a matter of reaching out to loads of people who we thought would be good at speaking so we had um Manchester Labour students sent a speaker um Jade Doswell from the Fallowfield Council spoke um the People's Assembly spoke uh, sent a speaker um and a few others as well um so that was that then we had the speakers sorted the next thing was like building it which I mean I've built protests before so you know you sort of know what goes into it but this was I mean arguably pretty easy to build it was just a matter of riding on the riding the wave that was already happening so we just pushed it we invited everyone we knew we invited uh, the student union who then decided you know helped help build it as well they had like a banner making session right before the protest and then loads of them marched down um from the student union to where we had the protest um so it's just a matter of pushing it pushing it pushing it inviting people um the press picked up on it without too much worrying from us which is just luck really to be honest um so we had i think itv interviewed one of our organizers about it um someone from resist rape culture which is like another campaign um and then the BBC came, the Guardian came, the Evening Standard um, interviewed me the, like the day before about it. So we, we were we were doing pretty well. Um, I think I think it was Salford Uni Unison, uh, the union trade union decided to unanimously support it. And then we borrowed the PA system of Manchester State Trades Council. So we had like basically backing from everyone you need backing from. We had backing from the student union, trade unions, the People's Assembly, uh, the press. Um, and then Andy Burnham came, so we had his backing too. So I think it was in the run up to it, I knew it was going to be pretty big, um, just from the amount of sort of responses we were getting and questions we were getting and press calls and stuff we all seem to have been doing. But I didn't think it was going to be that big. You know, it was, it was, it was, I mean, 1,500 to 2,000 people is, is the guess that I'm saying. I think the press will probably say it was about 12, but um, it was, it was massive. Um, I remember I was like standing on, the steps in St Peter's Square outside the sort of Manchester Central Library which is sort of this raised position and from the position I was standing you could see basically all the way down Oxford Road and I just remember in the sort of 10 to 15 minutes um, either side of seven o'clock when the um, assembly period was I could just see swarms of people coming with their homemade placards and just like they just didn't like they just kept coming so when it was time to sort of start the protest and, and we, we read the, a list of the um this year's hem femicide victims we let we read 110 names of women who've been killed by men which was just horrible um the protest was massive and I was just honestly just completely in awe especially when Andy Burnham and Sasha Lord um came came along and said hello which was just completely surreal uh, and Sa Sasha Lord is the person who owns the nighttime advisor to Manchester and also owns 
Park Life and the Warehouse Project, which are two massive like music events that happen in Manchester. So it's just completely surreal seeing the sheer amount of people there and then seeing them two people there. It was just, it was amazing. And then the mood was, I mean, the mood was exactly where you want it to be in a protest. Um, and I think that was in part due to the, the stewards we had who were chanting and the people who organised it. And then just we, we definitely hit the right, the right um, mood for, for speakers as well. So it was, um, it was like a mixture of sort of anger and power and reflection as well, because, you know, this issue spiking sounds like it's a single issue thing and that you know if we stop spiking we'll be happy but it's linked to much much deeper things it's linked to uh, sexual violence and and sexual abuse and sort of domestic abuse and, and rape and all these really horrible things that happen to people and that happen to women um so it was a reflection on you know spiking is just the sort of the tip of the iceberg in terms of what bad things happen you know just because people are awful um and and it was it was good and and it was radical as well because people know that the police are to blame uh people know that the council are to blame people know that the the bouncers and the promoters and the clubs themselves who are massively rich and have loads of money um are to blame and people know that it's the vulnerable people that this affects the worst um so it was, it was pretty radical and people were angry and it wasn't just misdirected anger. It wasn't just we were angry at every single man ever because that's not the problem. It's it's the people who have the power who are doing nothing about it. Um, so it was, it was hugely powerful. Um, and we marched past, we marched, which we didn't tell anyone we were going to do, but we did march. And I was surprised that like, everyone joined the march as well. Andy Burnham couldn't stand the march, but everyone else could. Um, so we marched down past loads we went to this this area called Deansgate in Manchester so where there's loads of clubs we marched past loads of clubs um that are pretty like notoriously bad for spiking uh we watched we watched it was it was quite surreal because we marched past a club that two of my friends had been spiked at exactly a year ago um where they were spiked by the promoter and I had to sort of you know get them home after they'd been spiked and we're just completely unresponsive and it was which was obviously really horrible for everyone involved so it was surreal going past these clubs where women get spiked and I imagine it was the same for loads of the people on the march going past a club where you yourself might have been spiked on this anti-spiking protest with a megaphone saying shame on you shame on you to the club um so it was it was just insane it's honestly I'm still sort of in awe that that was you know me and I played a small role in getting that many people in the streets and and then we, uh, well, we we had the final rally uh, next to the statue of Engels, which was quite nice as well, because obviously I'm a socialist. Not everyone on the march was, but it was probably nice for those of us who are to, to be, you know, continue with Manchester's radical history at the foot of Engels, which was, yeah, it was good. Absolutely, it sounds brilliant. And then, um, you know, you're talking about kind of how people are very clear about what they're angry about and they're, they're angry and do you think do you think that with the attacks on women and clap and common by the police um the failure of the justice system to deal with abuse rape um harassment and the failure to address day-to-day -day problems in women's lives such as pay inequality um do you think women have had enough do you think that's what's happening at the moment yeah I think I think there's a lot of anger amongst women at the minute um I think ever since the Sarah Everard thing Sarah Everard thing the brutal murder of an innocent woman by a serving police officer and then the reaction of the same police force to the vigil um followed by the murders of Biba Henry and Nicole, Small, Nicole Smallman where the police um you know took selfies with their bodies and and like made jokes about their bodies and didn't I mean didn't investigate these two sisters who had gone missing because they'd gone missing the same day as a Black Lives Matter protest and the police assumed that they'd been drinking um and then the death of Sabina Nessa more recently so I think every single person on that march at least um who listened to the speeches will understand that the the police especially forces like the Met, Met Police and also Greater Manchester Police, which is pretty pretty bad too, and not on our side at all. Um, and Spiking Now has a completely anti-police um, sort of philosophy and any demands we have 
revolve around keeping the police away from the issue because the police don't help. I think we're entirely aware um, that the police and of course, by extension, the government don't care about this, about safety for women. It's the last thing on their mind. I mean, there's, you know, there's statistics for the amount of police who have been found guilty of domestic violence or, you know, rape and that kind of stuff just prove that, you know, the police don't care. And when you, um, if you are sexually assaulted, if you are spiked and then you report it to the police, most of the time the police don't take it seriously. You know, there'll be people on that march who have personal experience with that. I have personal experience with police just not taking that kind of stuff seriously at all. Um, so I think there's a lot of anger aimed, therefore, at the police and the state. Um, and then, of course, there's other issues that women face, like the pay gap. Um, it came out recently that as of this year, as of last year, the, the pay gap for women at the University of Manchester is over 17 percent, which is higher than the national average, I think. So I think it is a case of this is just sort of another thing to be annoyed about, another thing to be angry at. And I think to, to look at those statistics, to look at the reflect on the police and how they treat women and then reflect on the pay gap, you have to see this as a systemic issue, as an institutional issue. You can't just blame all men, which is what a lot of people want to do. Say so every man is a problem. No, not every man is a problem. Um, the problem comes from the very top. Um, and that's why, you know, when we protest, we're not protesting the existence of men. We're protesting the existence of these systems of power and, you know, the state that sort of seeks to keep us down and you know wants to like crush any protest or anything that you know where we try and stand up for ourselves I think I think women have had enough I mean I certainly feel way more angry about this kind of stuff than I have ever have done before I certainly feel right like personally I feel anyone if anyone touches me in a club or anything like that um previously before this whole thing I would just be like uh oh, gross leave it alone whereas now I'm ready to shout at someone if they you know do anything to me which may end up in you know putting me in more danger but I think I don't know I just probably have to interview every woman in the world but I think generally I think we're all pretty annoyed pretty annoyed at, at the situation we're in um which is why it's so good that we've got these protests at the minute um and that was certainly the mood on the protest I mean the police weren't really present at our protests there was a few of them who tried to ask me who I was and that kind of stuff um who will now know but they weren't there. I think if if they were there, it could have easily turned like an, into another clap and common situation. But I'm glad it didn't, um, and we all got home safe. So yeah, I think I think the anger is is not a, any other, anything other than the state at this point. I just don't know if everyone knows that, but I think people know that the protests are aimed somewhere, and it's probably the state they're aimed at. It's really interesting. And what so what are the demands of the campaign? Um, of in spiking now. Okay. Um, so what's next? Oh, that's a good age old question. So our demands um, are not a sort of revolve around prevention rather than anything else. Um, so rather than, for, ex for example, putting spikers or people who spike people um, in prison for 15 years, we want to pre completely prevent anyone getting spiked in the first place. So that involves um, sort of tackling the clubs going to the core where it happens and that is like the clubs and we're calling for probably the most important safeguarding issue is that we don't want clubs to throw people out who have been spiked because what happens at the minute is if 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 a bouncer or a spa staff or anyone in the club or music venue decides you're too drunk they'll just throw you out on the street regardless of if they're doing this alone you know regardless if if you're a crying 18 year old girl who's lost her phone or money or wallet, they'll just throw you out because they don't want to, they don't want to lose their license. So at the minute, the, the main thing we want is, is if, if you've been spiked in a club, you want to be able to go to a staff member and say, hey, I've been spiked, um, and for them to look after you. So we want a blanket ban of, of kicking people out of clubs because they've been spiked or because they're, you know, too drunk or anything like that. Um, we want instead clubs to have sort of trained staff to deal with people who've been spiked a special room they can take them into to look after people who've been spiked but we also want venues with repeated instances of spiking to just lose their license um whether that happens or not is another story but what we want is this threat you know if, if clubs don't pull their act together then there will be consequences um and it's easier to target clubs than it is perpetrators if that makes sense because you can't always catch perpetrators but you know exactly the clubs where loads of perpetrators are um you know 
um, you know, spiking people. Um, we want a, obviously a zero tolerance policy for anyone caught spiking. Uh, they should be thrown out of the club immediately. And we also want clubs to start taking complaints um, seriously, which they don't. Uh, if, if say, I mean, in, in any situation, if, if, if someone was to grope someone in the club, if I was to be groped in the club and I went over to the bouncer and said, hey, this happened to me, the bouncer probably wouldn't do anything. Um, so we want a zero, you know, a zero tolerance policy. If you get if you get spiked and you tell someone, then that person should believe you. Um, and we also have sort of aims and demands that are aimed more at the council, um, which are probably going to be more difficult to get. But we want a counselling service for victims of spiking, because I mean it's incredibly traumatic, especially if that spiking leads to more instant, you know, more violence against you. Um, we want um, a helpline for spiking victims because if you've been thrown out of a club, you can't necessarily afford a taxi. Um, we also want clubs to get, make sure that victims of spiking actually get home safe, so e.g. by calling them a taxi or something. Um, we want regular free night buses so that you can get home from a club safely. Um, at the minute, the night buses in Manchester are similar to the night buses in sort of London. They're not very regular and they are expensive um, and they're just difficult. So we want a, a night bus that is reliable and regular and free so that no matter the circumstance, you can probably get home. Um, we want um, sort of a medical staff or, you know, if you present to A&E with a complaint that you've been spiked, we want people, the NA, NA to then test test you for uh, day rape drugs like Rohypnol or GHB, um, which isn't necessarily their policy at the minute. Um, the issue is spiking drugs usually stay in your system for about six hours and the average A&E waiting time is four hours. And if the A&E staff don't decide that you're um, low risk, they're, just, they're not going to prioritise you, um, which is obviously an issue of the NHS being underfunded and completely overwhelmed rather than the NHS not caring about spiking victims. Um, we want drug amnesty boxes on the door at clubs. Um, which is a safeguarding issue anyway. It's, it's unlikely to, to necessarily stop many spikers, but it's more symbolic, you know. Um, it's there. You can, you can change your mind. You know, it's not too late. And then finally, we want the council to publish sort of monthly reports on um, where spiking happens so that we know that if, if you know, there are 10 times more spiking instances at this club than there are at this club, then we can go to that club. Um, if that makes sense. So, you know, we're not, we're, we're not asking for the world, you know, we're not, we're not st sitting here asking for impossible things. We know exactly what we want and we know these messages to keep people safe. And, you know, it's from personal experience in clubs to all sorts of things. So hopefully um, if we can keep pushing, we can get that. And in, in terms of pushing, um, and spiking now is sort of primarily a, a, a protest campaign group, I guess. We're going to keep protesting is the plan. Um, we are meeting with the council. We are meeting with the people who can change things sort of this week and the student union at the University of Manchester as well. Um, I guess depending this week is just to see what the council says, to see what changes are going to be made. And in the likely event that they don't do enough, We'll just we'll just do another protest. We'll just call it another protest, and hopefully we can keep on the momentum that we have um, and do a bigger protest with even more support from even more people, um, and just disrupt, disrupt, disrupt until until we um, get what we want. And that's just a case of mobilising enough people because spiking cases aren't going to stop. People aren't going to get stop stop um, spiking or being spiked. Um, unless someone pushes for serious change to happen, like fundamental, pretty radical change um, in the clubs and in the council and sort of in the music venues. Um, so that's, that's what we're after. Thanks, Lucy. Um, and see you on the streets protesting. Oh yeah, see you on the streets. <laughs> Bye.